Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed our first uh, Friday panel earlier today uh, with two of the Northern Crime Syndicate authors. Um, settling back now for a fabulous um, Friday evening. I, I, I have to say, I, I've been looking forward to this for so long. And then when they said, sorry, but we need to cancel the, the, the physical festival, and, and quite rightly so, um, all those plans, all those possible conversations, and yet with the wonders of technology and also with the, the graciousness of, of authors that are taking part this weekend, at least we can bring you the spirit of, of Newcastle Noir and that's the main thing. Um, I hope that, you know, from wherever you're watching um, and if we can host it physically again next year, you know, you would be most welcome to come back. My author this evening is somebody who is really one of the cornerstones of, of, of the festival and the spirit of the festival. It gives me great pleasure to welcome LJ Ross. Louise, welcome. Hello, nice to see you. Lovely to see you. I, I, I you know, as, as the director of this crazy festival, I want to thank you for, for having inputted so much into helping make the festival what it has become. So thank you for that. Indeed, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having, having me on board. Not a bother, not a bother. And, 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 and it follows nicely in for me to say that one of the, 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 one of the aspects of Newcastle Noir that you have helped change is the fact that there is now um, a crime fiction prize attached to the festival, um, the Linda's Farm Prize, which, you know, you know, you've spearheaded that and, and it's such a, you know, it's, it's so much fun to be involved with, with what you're doing with that. Um, and as is custom and practice, the winner of that prize is, is announced on the Friday evening. So I am just going to hand over this session to you for now and, and I'll come back and ask you some questions later. But please, LJ Ross, the Linda's Farm Prize Award. All right, well, Jonathan. Um, First of all, I just want to thank everybody um, who submitted their work this year. So the inaugural prize last year had um, a good couple of hundred submissions, which was really encouraging. Um, but this year we had well over 500. So um, I think particularly at a moment where people are in the midst of a pandemic, um, it was so encouraging to see people still throwing their hat in the ring, still having a go, not losing sight of creative dreams, which really was part of the reason we set up the prize in the first place. Um, I wanted to try to promote and encourage arts in the region, um, but also to celebrate it as well. So the prize comes from sort of two perspectives, and that's why we say that if you're from the Northeast or resident in, um, you can enter, or you may not be living in the area, but you'd be celebrating the area in your story. So whichever, whichever side you fall into, it's still very much um, celebrating the best traditions of the region. And we wanted to um, create a prize that celebrated raw storytelling capability. Um, not necessarily who is best at spellings and grammar and things like that, because we can all get an editor. I mean, I, you know, myself included, we all, we all polish our stories. So I wasn't necessarily looking for the, the finished article. And I know, you know, Jackie, you're on the judging panel as well. We had enormous uh, fun and in fact, a privilege to read everybody's um, submissions. And this year, it was very difficult. Um, and we uh, whittled it down to six in the end, six on the shortlist. Um, and they were William Humphrey, who wrote North of the Tyne, um, which had a, a really a fantastic, interesting premise, um, which was uh, that his main protagonist was a head teacher, which is not something that I've seen before in crime mm. writing. So that was really interesting and uh, potentially drawn from his own life experience um, in education as well. So that was fantastic. Uh, we had Brian Gould, who wrote um, The Brides of Seldom Seen. And again, really sort of um, rich writing there as well, very different voice. Um, and that possibly draws upon the fact that, you know, he spent a lifetime traveling, very well-traveled person, but also worked um, in the mining industry in the Northeast as he mm. was growing up. So, you know, he had a real texture to his writing as well. Eleanor Davies, who wrote A Man Outside, 
Um, and, you know, again, we all sort of said, was fantastically crafted the way that she wove her storytelling as well, it was Maurice Whitaker wrote The Magpie. And um, we had, you know, fantastic fun reading that as well, because we felt that it had a real contemporary Northeastern mm. flavor. Mm. You know? mm. um, I think all of us really loved how she'd captured um, the flavor of the Northeast, which is, is very much what this is about. Prue Heathcote wrote Don't Leave. And, you know, what we loved about that was she had this great twist in the tale of the story. Um, and there were uh, shades of Daphne du Maurier coming through there as well. And, and really a very uh, a rich story as well. And finally, we had Richard Gardner, who wrote The Darkest Way Out. And his was different again, because, you know, you had um, historical mm -hmm. storytelling, which I think is actually quite hard in itself, because it, it does require a different kind of research um, to get that right as well. So, um, so very well done to him and very well done to all of them, because uh, one thing that we could say of every one of them is that we wanted to read on. So yes. yeah. before I announce the winner, I just want to say to every one of them, if your name isn't the one that I'm about to say, please don't be disheartened at all. And that goes to everybody who entered, mm -hmm. um, because uh, this, is, this is very much uh, a game of raw storytelling and it's fantastic. So without further ado though, this year's winner is through Heathcote, uh, who wrote Don't Leave. Um, I think every one of us really felt that in a, in a very difficult, um, a very difficult decision-making scenario, we mm. felt that having read hers, it was perhaps one where everything, all of the ends, just the strands seemed to come together in um, an established story. So very, very well done to Prue. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for weaving a story that was so interesting in terms of its slightly supernatural content as well, which mm. to meld different genres in crime fiction like that is not an easy skill. Quite, yeah. So actually to do that as a debut author um, celebrates exactly what we're looking for, which is that kind of raw talent. So um, very, very well done to you, Prue. And I'll be contacting you separately, if I haven't already, by the time this recording goes out. Um, and I will be contacting everyone else as well. Um, so well done to everybody who made the shortlist and to everybody who actually tried, because it's brave to put yourself out there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's not a small thing to do. So well done to everybody. Wonderful. Louise, thank you. It, it, it was indeed a joy to read those submissions and, and very well done, Prue. Um, I do recall um, feeling extremely spooked uh, as, as I read um, and, and all those feelings of no, don't go there or <laughs> so, so wonderful. But as you say, um, all of those, you know, all, all of the shortlist really brought out the flavor of the Northeast or the spaces uh, in the Northeast. And, and I know for the festival that whilst it, it is so important for me anyway, for us to do local, national and international crime writing, that those local voices, that new talent, either in the northeast or that highlights the northeast that that we bring that out and we celebrate that i, I think that is vital oh, so that's one of the i really wanted to make sure that the prize went ahead this year um but it's something as well that we will be taking forward next year so if you know anybody's been watching this and and maybe we're teetering on the edge of whether to submit this year or not um i say always go for it you know you never know until you try. And sometimes, um, you know, one of our, our first winner last year, Cressida Downing, who wrote The Role Bearer's Daughter, which was a historical crime fiction, very interesting voice set on Holy Island as well, actually. Um, she's now finished that novel and is moving on to her second. And one of the things that she said to us was, you know, it was very much the oomph that she needed to just finish it, you know, because mm -hmm. I think the confidence can be a thing um, when you're writing a book. There's always something to distract you and you can always you can always find an excuse not to finish something, you know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes having a goal like this to work towards can really give you that final um, oomph, as I say, to finish. So if you find yourself in that situation, you think you've got a story to tell, but you're not sure, you're umming and ahhing and you have been for a while, and um, it might be something worth thinking about next year um, to enter because 
I have to say it was, as I said, a privilege to read all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly even the act of finishing the story is um, something to be congratulated. So. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and Louise, you will put up details um, about next year's competition. Yeah, people should watch, watch that space, yeah? Yeah, they'll be updated on my website um, and we're going to have uh, an updated portal for next year as well. Mm -hmm. So it will all be very user friendly. It will probably be open for submissions from September this time around. So mm -hmm. September to the end of March 2021. So that's a good few months that you'll have to submit. But you can start thinking about it now. Start maybe crafting a story if you haven't already um, and have plenty of time leading in because all you need is two chapters and a synopsis of a work in progress or just a short story of no more than 10,000 words. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it sounds uh, easy for me to say, but it, it's not too, not too long. So, so long as um, you start thinking about it now, it shouldn't be too, uh, too much of an ask. Wonderful. Thank you. So time for me to, to give you a lovely grilling. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I promise Dr. Noir will be gentle. I promise. Um, so international best-selling author. Um, I read recently, and, and the figures are constantly changing for you, um, which is wonderful. Um, over 4 million copies of your writing sold worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, two protagonists now, because you have two series developing, two protagonists that crime readers have really taken to and taken to their heart. So if you'd allow me to say, I think what you write, whilst, and as I was looking into all the different novels that you've written, they're quite gory in places. I mean, you know, such a wonderful yeah, woman. That, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm glad there's this camera between us, really. I think it's good. Um, but I think what you write is really a love letter to Northumberland or a love letter to the Northeast. Do you, do you think that's a fair comment on what you write? Yeah, I mean, it's um, obviously with the Gregory book, it's a slightly different thing again because mm. um, I'm, you know, I'm there international and things, but focusing on the DCI Ryan series, which was my first series, and um, I started writing that when I was still living away from the Northeast. So I was down south and I had been living in London for 12 years and we had our son and we were tied very much by our work back then. Um, but then I left my former job as a barrister and, and decided to, to try a creative life. Um, and that's how I ended up writing Holy Island. But when I started writing that, you're absolutely right. I was missing and pining for home. Um, mm -hmm. And all of these sort of childhood memories of where I'd been on the weekends, you know, uh, Cragside and Bambra very much, we used to go all the time. Um, I found myself really hankering for that landscape and that countryside. Mm -hmm. So I think definitely you're absolutely right. I take a lot of inspiration from the scenery. So even now I'm living in the Northeast and have been mm -hmm. for a couple of years now. Um, we'll go on walks, uh, at least during normal time anyway. Mm -hmm. um, go for walks out into Kielder, we take Ethan with us, my son. Um, and when I was writing Dark Skies, we went for a long weekend and we just trampled around <laughs> uh, the lake. And, you know, we really, we went over the dam and things. and you know, really kind of try to immerse yourself. Um, and we'll do several trips like that. So it becomes a, a personal journey of rediscovery. Um, mm. And I always feel that if I am mentioning real places, that I want to try to reflect um, the best feel that I, that I get from that place. You know, I mean, it's never going to be the same as if I was born and grew up in Kielder Village, you know. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but I think that somebody who is from the region, who appreciates the region, um, and is actively looking for the best in it. That's not to say that I'm blind to um, areas which need investment or areas that we as a society or a community could work on, but what it does mean is that I see the community spirit, and that is what I want to reflect um, mm -hmm. in my writing. And I think a lot of my readers sort of anecdotally say that when they come back to the books, it's like friends. It's like meeting friends again. And that's mm. exactly what I want, yeah. you know, because I think the reading for me is, is, um, is an escape. It's falling into the story, fictional reading that is. Mm. Um, 
And I think that, you know, in those times when I cast my mind back when I was first writing Holy Island, I was not loving my job. Um, I, I just couldn't do that. But I was, life in London really had grown a bit old for me. Um, and it had been for a few years. And so I was sitting reading and, and reading all of these big atmospheric books because I was seeking um, that sort of life and that sort of world, you know. And I thought, well, I can't be the only one who feels this way. So yeah. that's what I think for me. Beautiful, beautiful. The, the, because I say, you, you know, you, you write, you write darkly. There is no doubt about it, but there is, but there is such a, a warmth there when it comes to drawing the space as character you know it, 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 I, 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 I'm part of a book group and we always talk about do we get the sense of place and space when we read and and you know your work does that you know unquestioningly it's you just know and that sense of coming home and coming home to friends as you say it's lovely but I wonder could we step back in time a little um, to, to, to pre-writing days or pre-publication days anyway? Um, you mentioned um, that in a former life, um, you were a barrister and I read that you trained at, at, at King's College in London. And I also read that part of, of your study time, you went to Paris and, and to Florence, yeah? yeah. And, and I wonder, could, you know, as, because we've spoken, you know, the fondness there for the region, but you are somebody who also likes to travel. And, and I wonder that that time when you were spent time abroad during your studies, has that in any way informed the way you write, do you think, you know, the, the, the being elsewhere? Definitely. Um, well, actually, it's been really nice to explore um, Paris again through, I wrote a book called Hysteria, which is part of the Gregory series. Mm -hmm. And that's all set in Paris. And you know, that was, um, that was such a nice experience to write because I went to Paris in 2010 for um, I think six or seven months and I just lived there. And James would come and visit me on the weekend, you know, and I was studying at the Sorbonne over there. And, you know, I'd go to classes, but then the rest of the time it was very much every day I was walking miles. I always joke, I mean, I was, I was eating, you know, cheese, drinking wine, I've never been more unhealthy in my diet, and yet was so skinny because you're just walking for miles. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm also a bit younger, so um, things like that. So I loved it because the thing is, um, as a Brit, I think sometimes we all develop stereotypes about other people in other countries and, mm. and there's this thing about the French and about them being snooty and all this. I have never found that actually. When I moved to Paris, um, I lived in a teeny tiny little flat and it was lovely, but they had a little cafe on the corner where I'd go and have a coffee and read and, and work. Um, and the people just couldn't have been friendlier. And I was trying to work on my language skills. I did speak French, but I was trying to get from intermediate to being a bit more fluent. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, their English language was just outstanding. So it would have been so easy. It's always the way. <laughs> it's so easy to say, Madame, did you mean to say this? You know, <laughs> they loved me and they let me practice and they were really, really friendly. And you know, you started to build up a community. You know, you'd take your, take your laundry to the laundrette and you know, get chatting to people and go and just discover a different place. And I suppose that's what I try to do in the Northeast as well. When I say that I go and visit places for days on end, I'm trying to immerse myself in mm -hmm. them so that I understand what the feeling is like mm -hmm. uh, and where the differences lie, if there are any. And that was the same with Paris. And, um, and you know, I lived uh, for a few months in uh, Florence as well. So that was, that was another lovely experience. Mm -hmm. And there are certain places, I think, um, because I love art, if I hadn't have gone into the law, I wanted to go to art school. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this was going way back. <laughs> um, so, you know, there you are. I had the choice of a creative profession or something that was slightly more logic based. And when I was 18, I had to choose. So mm -hmm. I chose one direction and then through writing, had come back around to another. Um, but I, I still paint at home and I still draw and do all of those things. So um, I think having an appreciation for that sort of history of art is what attracted me to places like Florence and having 
all of those Renaissance painters there in, in the Uffizi Gallery, which I was determined to get into a story, which is why it's in the Hermitage um, with, uh, with Ryan. And so many readers, though, have said, it's lovely to just sometimes take them for a holiday somewhere mm, and mm. take them out of their normal because people do people go away you know and how are they are they the same person when they're yeah. you know um and to sort of delve a little bit into the character's backstory because as with all characters i'm sure you know writer friends of mine would say the same thing that we we lend a little bit of ourselves into every character that we write mm -hmm. both good and bad you know um because, you know, when I'm writing the baddies, I have to imagine myself, if I was a really horrible person, <laughs> what would I do? <laughs> you know, I'm having to ask myself these questions to step into their shoes, kind of. Otherwise, there's an inauthenticity to it. You know, you can read true crime. Mm -hmm. See, in my previous legal career, I met some characters. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you are always slightly stepping into someone's shoes um, to be able to create something. So... Yeah, those experiences, I think travel is so important if you can, um, you know, to try to, to just to appreciate why people think differently, maybe mm -hmm. people are coming from, um, where the differences lie. I think there's a danger in becoming too tunnel visioned, you know, and then staying always in your own bubble. I mean, obviously it, it depends on your circumstances, but now with the world that we live in, yes. even if you aren't able to physically travel, I think it's something that can be explored in so many other ways. You can take a 3D tour of Durham Cathedral if you had never been, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you can see so much now um, in a way that just wasn't possible 20 or 30 years ago. So mm -hmm. I think it's very much the world is a global one. And that's kind of what I've tried to reflect through the characters, whether or not they're always based in the Northeast or whether they're traveling internationally. Yeah. Lovely. I, I, just to pick up on what you said, I do, I do wonder, you know, as we've all been confined, you know, f f to be safe, I wonder as well, is it also where possible, given us, as you say, that chance to maybe explore places virtually that we would never you know, physically, we may never have that opportunity or possibility to go to. So you think, yeah, a good, a good escape to be had to travel virtually at the minute. I just want to stick back in, 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 in your legal days, just to ask, not necessarily the, the characters that you came across or the cases that you dealt with, but I wonder the skills that you developed within the legal profession have you parked them are they you know are they long forgotten in a drawer or do you find that as an author there were things that you learned and developed that are actually really helpful um i think probably the most helpful thing and i often hear this from people how can you write so quickly um and i think that was very much drawn on my legal career because when i say to people now i can write x amount of words a day they go <laughs> Um, but I was writing 10,000 word advices daily when I was, um, when I was a lawyer. So, you know, um, you very much get into the habit of writing. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm not daunted by a blank page. Um, for me, probably, uh, the thing that takes the most time is the plotting beforehand. You know, that's something that I have to really think about. Mm -hmm. um, but the actual act of writing is something that's definitely taken from my previous experience. Um, when you train to be a barrister, you, you do a number of different courses within that. And one of them is things like evidence and um, criminal procedure and, and things like this. Uh, you learn about the Police and Criminal Evidence Act um, and, you know, you get to know through your then on the job experience how certain procedures run. So it's, it's always quite funny because when I'm writing fiction, um, if I were to include all of the procedures that would be taken in real life and um, i think it would just be it would be another carbon copy of the pace guidelines you know i think it would be a very dull story <laughs> so you know so but, but sometimes i am um deliberately overlooking um or skipping over a procedure mm -hmm. for the pacing of the story yeah, you yeah. Know? and i have to think i'm writing fiction and I'm not writing, you know, um, so there were, that was something I had to overcome because when you're taught to write in a very forensic way um, with an eye for detail and, and all of these things, then having to switch your voice into something that is 
I suppose more conversational mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is is a little bit tricky and I struggled with that initially I wrote, wrote several drafts of Holy Island and the first draft has been destroyed <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I should look back on it now if I'm ever having a bad day and make myself feel better. Um, but, you know, it, it was tricky because in dialogue, you know, mm -hmm. that was something I had to really click into. But now it's one of the things that I enjoy the most. You know, mm -hmm. I love writing dialogue. I'm interested in writing screenplays now. Um, you know, I really, really love that side to it and the human interaction side. Um, and I think some, this is partly something that comes with experience. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also a shift in mindset. Um, Sometimes I do get some very helpful readers. They're so sweet. They get in touch and they say, I don't know if you knew, but actually this would happen in that. I said, oh, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where likewise with strict rules of grammar, mm. for the most part, I mean, again, that's part of, you know, we were taught very forensically to, to be um, hot on things like that. Um, <laughs> But I found quite early on that if I were to follow every rule of syntax, then it seemed to, it didn't sound authentic as to how people speak, you know. And, and so I had to ask myself the question and I spoke with, you know, my editor as well. And we, we talked about it. And actually, there are certain times where we will actively ignore a rule. Well, yeah, yeah. For the flow of the story, um, not every time, but sometimes. Um, but for the most part, you know, we like the general rule that I follow is I don't like people to feel interrupted in their reading. If you ever have to stop when you're reading a book because something's bothered you, then something's not quite right. So mm -hmm. it's trying for the most part to to weed out those moments, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whatever might be causing them. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for that insight into into your your style of writing and, and what's important to you and, and you know in in your creation. Um, you mentioned that people um, often comment on your productivity, shall we call it? Um, if my stats are right, um, two thousand and fifteen to two thousand and twenty. That's five years and seventeen novels so far. I've actually written 18, but uh, <laughs> some other stuff didn't make it. Uh, yeah. And things that are in development, uh, development mm -hmm. at the moment as well. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, my, I think um, this is one of the things, actually, coming back to the Lindisfarne Prize. I think that, you know, uh, in any industry, we can sometimes be guilty of creating an echo chamber around ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there can be... Um, notions of what it means to be a writer you know yes. and that we all sit in towers with quill pens and we take years crafting and and things like that you know a lot of the writer friends that I have when I've spoken to them um say that they can write a novel quite quickly but then because of publishing schedules or whatever it might be mm -hmm. it takes another year after that before it comes out you know yes um but the actual act of writing the story is Rel relatively quick you know depending on their own lifestyle so they may very well find that they're like me which is you get an idea in your head mm -hmm. and the story uh sort of takes over your world in a way your internal space mm -hmm. so when you're waking up in the morning you're kind of ready to write the next bit you know um so when you are very focused on the story that you're telling um you just kind of don't want to get it out mm -hmm. you know, you yeah you want to really just race through and, and try to get the story out onto the page um it may not be perfect after that first draft but you know it's the but it's, but it's out there yeah exactly. yeah so yeah I, I, um, I do find that that's the case yeah i wonder and, and it's sort of like this leads nicely into it because you you know you mentioned you know the the editing process the publishing process i'm always keen to ask authors do they feel trapped in the, the two-sided coin of a book a year you know because that is the way that the publishing you know the traditional publishing industry at the moment seems to function i'm, I'm intrigued to see what might happen you know post pandemic you know are, are things changed after that but of course for yourself being self-published and of course you know i they, i know there's no need for us to enter into the one way or the other because it, it it's that's not the question 
but but I wanted to ask you the freedom that you felt because you chose to go a certain route um, and and all that that's brought with it could you speak to us about that yeah um it's funny because when I first started I knew nothing about publishing um being a lawyer I wasn't a media lawyer or anything like that and I I did what probably a lot of people think they have to do you know I, I um sent off my manuscript to about 12 agents and publishers who would accept direct submissions and actually some that didn't just because I didn't check <laughs> read the fine print now <laughs> well it all got back to me actually i thought it just goes balls sometimes um i had to say i realize now with hindsight that's a ridiculously small number because i understand that you know a lot of other authors who send it to hundreds of, of agents and things um and i had a really nice positive response back and i actually had an offer of publication from a mid-sized press but in that moment where you're supposed to feel elated and you think is is this is this is it, yeah hey you know first time out brilliant um but then the sort of the contract arrived and i thought <laughs> i don't know about this so james um my husband uh was the one who actually suggested i had not heard of um kindle direct publishing as the platform that you can use there are mm -hmm. other uh, ways but i i use kindle direct publishing and i had a kindle um and had read on that but i didn't know that that this existed at all and it was a whole new world you know and James said well why don't you give it a go you know and it's great coming to that with no preconceptions you know yeah. I have yeah. absolutely no baggage whatsoever so I just thought sure you right. know I had, a look at the, I had a look at the terms and conditions it seemed like a no-brainer to be honest you know and I'm very logical you know the way that I look at things I think mm -hmm. um the terms for authors where that you get to keep your creative freedom you know and, and as you say that's the independence that I I was striving for and looking for in life you know I love my independence it's not to say that I don't uh, rely on people for things or that I don't live a social life yes it's something that I value very highly is mm. independence and so being able to take decisions that allow your own personal creativity to flourish um, I think were important to me mm. and so um, you know with Holy Island if you cast your mind back five years ago, um, in crime fiction, within publishing circles, it was the sort of thing where crime fiction is one thing, romance is another, and there the twain shall meet. Yeah. However, in Holy Island, <laughs> we did have a little, a little romance. So, <laughs> you know, and I remember a couple of the agents had said to me, well, you have to get rid of all of that. You know, crime fiction is this route and, and romance is another. You can't have both. And I thought, but I quite like having that in there, you know. And I thought, well, I don't really, it feels like a very different novel if you change that, you know. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason I'd crafted Ryan was that he wasn't supposed to fall into these tropes of, um, you know, a detective who could never hold down a relationship, that he was so damaged that he didn't know the, the difference between emotional well being and not, you know. So I wanted to sort of do something that was aspirational i suppose you know i want him to be a character where he has such a um a strong moral yardstick mm -hmm. that there's a comfort to reading that you know um, yes yeah yeah if i can just jump in really quickly i i think you know again those those decisions because and and there are many of them that i'm so fond of but contemporary crime fiction is awash with damaged male and female detectives both professional and, and 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 you know and those you know private PIs and things like that I, I think I think it was brave of you to you know to think I, I am going to do something different with my detective you know and, and again traditional publishers might be saying to you this you know this character just doesn't sit within you know what what readers expect yeah. and I love the fact that, that, that you know that those sales figures seem to, to speak differently about what readers enjoy, you know? Well, it's interesting because it walked a line because I um, have got to know my readership quite well now. You hear from a lot of them and um, some started out with Holy Island being uh, a fan of traditional crime fiction and then they could forgive the romance. Mm -hmm. And then you had people who preferred romantic suspense who could forgive the crimey bits, you know? Mm -hmm. So you created this new uh, middle road that people could get on board with and then and then follow the characters through the series so that was wonderful that you know it managed to walk the line that 
um, you know, each side was balanced, you know? Yeah. So, but that is through independence. And I suppose what I always say to some writers just starting out is that don't be afraid to be brave because, you know, um, trends have to start somewhere. You know, uh, you don't always have to follow the trends. You can set them. <laughs> so it's it's quite nice to be able to um, take decisions based very much on your own kind of creative freedom and what you feel is is the best direction for the characters that ultimately you've created. Because I think within writing circles, if um, a publisher quite understandably is driven by um, big business concerns. Mm -hmm and they have a lot of authors to, to worry about and to think about, they may be encouraging, um, and I'm speaking very broadly here, not everyone is the same. Of course. They may be encouraging some writers to write in a certain way or write about a certain topic. And as a writer, you might be thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's really me, or I'm not sure if I can write, you know, psychological mm -hmm. thrillers when I prefer to write murder mysteries, you know? So, I think writers can sometimes fall into um, routes and directions that aren't necessarily of their making. Mm. And another thing that can come from that is a feeling of um, worry or competition mm. because they're looking at what else is, is um, being enjoyed by readers and they're thinking, well, I write very differently to that. So maybe readers wouldn't enjoy what I've done. Whereas actually, I would always say to them, um, there is a reader for everything I've found, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, I was speaking to a writer friend of mine the other day who's extremely talented, you know, and can write characters that are so authentic and true that her readership know that, you know, and they follow her wherever she goes. And um, I think through the course of a life, you know, you can sometimes be swayed in different directions but then actually that's the core there. That's, that's your voice and that's what's working so well. And it's just sometimes not losing sight of that. And I think the one thing I'd say about remaining independent is that it makes that much easier for me to um, follow my own path, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. And if we talk about that path, because from, um, you know, going from that, that, that Amazon publishing, you've moved on within that same sphere but there's now the dark skies imprint mm -hmm. is there not can can you tell us when was the moment that that just came into being and and what are you what are you looking to do with it so um readers who follow me would already know so my books uh, are always available <laughs> in ebook on the amazon platform and they always will be um you can also get uh printed paperbacks through Amazon as well which is the kind of KDP print versions mm -hmm. um, and then we have the audiobooks and things like that but there is still I mean my approach is very much always the reader is king so if there are any readers um, even in a minority sector who would say I prefer to buy from the high street and you know I want to buy in a certain way um, I don't want anyone to feel impeded in enjoying mm -hmm. stories um, and how they choose to purchase is very much up to them, you know, and, how, and whether, and then you also have readers who enjoy going to the libraries and things like that, you know. Yeah. So, um, throughout, I've always, always worked with libraries, and so they've always been available there, and they've always been available in a number of independent bookstores as well. So particularly in the region, obviously, um, got to know lovely Helen at Forum Books, and, yes. and Claire at uh, Cogito Books, and lots of other smaller bookshops, always been very supportive and lovely. Um, so they've always been available there, but I suppose um, if you are the reader who doesn't really uh, prefer to read on a Kindle, for example, or, or anything like that, I think it's just important to me to make it available to absolutely everybody. So Dark Skies Publishing enables me to do print runs to make them available more readily in supermarkets and, you know, in high street bookstores um and and to do that more easily mm -hmm. on a secondary level for me as well well i won't even say secondary it's actually very important to me to have those print runs available also allows me to donate in wider bulk um to places who may be looking for their next good read you know so at the moment we've got a free books for care homes offer and we've had it running for weeks since this started and mm -hmm. um, we and my husband actually his father used to run uh, care homes years ago so it's quite close to our mm. heart before Harold passed away lovely Harold um, and it just occurred to me how lonely that would be 
um, in an environment where your relatives can't visit at the moment yeah. and things like that. And also for the carers who um, are doing such an incredible job at the mm -hmm. moment as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we said, well, we've got a, a stock at the moment of books and I'd rather you know, you were getting some distraction and having and finding some joy. And if you can, then we're very willing to do this. So they follow all the usual hygiene protocols and taking deliveries. But we've we've supplied, um, you know, to hundreds of, of care homes around the country now. So mm -hmm. the packages there. So that has enabled me to do that very readily because mm -hmm. they come straight from the print distributor. Mm -hmm in Glasgow so that makes that uh, much easier yeah. for us to could, for me. could I just ask a question um if you know as we're talking about this and, and, and the wonderful that I you know that being able you know to to reach people and, and give people a beautiful distraction in in these times if there's a, a care home out there who who hasn't had the benefit can, can they get in touch with you still Louise Sure. So we say email admin at darkskiespublishing.co.uk and it has to come from the care home so we know the contact there. Indeed. But if they email that address, um, we'll arrange for that to happen. Wonderful. And if anybody watching um, later on uh, or doesn't catch the, the, the address or anything like that, then just message either myself or, or Louise for, for those details because that's that, lovely. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I interrupted the flow about. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was mes I was mesmerized. It's like, oh my God. So um, it, it gives you again, does it not with, with that ability, the chance to um, get your work into places as you say um where it, you know previously it might not have made because people you know I, I wanted to ask you as well because having had the, the beautiful pleasure of, of visiting you at home i know sometimes people say you know lj ross the ebook what you know so what does she think about you know the published paperwork and even as we look now and we can see behind you you know that shelf there but but oh my lord that's like the thumbnail of of, of what is in your house you know there's no doubt about it that you know your fondness for the printed word <laughs> is immense yeah i think sometimes there is uh, this sometimes happens there's a big misconception about people who choose to publish independently yeah. they, somehow this has developed this odd law of people who, who publish independently therefore mustn't appreciate the printed book and i think <laughs> what <laughs> hello <laughs> yeah. no how a got to b but you know i think that it's just one of those misconceptions that's built up um no i think that uh as i say it's very much um a case of buying habits you know a lot of people actually do like to read on it on an e-reader and I, i'm not judging i like both you know yes. it's not a case of one or the other totally uh, you know say with my mum for example um you know she has glaucoma so on a kindle it's quite nice to be able to alter the text you know to make it bigger yes. very easily um whereas some people i know prefer just to have a paperback in large print so it's really it's a case for the individual and so for me um i've always thought i like to make it so that nobody has to choose you know mm. it's a case of whatever works best for you because the reader is the most important i think that in um the marketplace certainly with my business i found that um you know good 85 percent of readers do prefer an ebook but that's not to say that that 15 percent of audio listeners and anyone else is less important because they're not you know yeah. it's it's a case of making it so that everybody can enjoy the story however they like you know and that's like me you know I, I have a kindle absolutely full of books uh which is really handy just to pop in my handbag or just to you know um, if if life were normal at the moment and i would be out on the go and traveling and things like that it's quite nice to be able to stock up and go on holiday and have it like that you know yeah. um but equally i'm really getting into audiobooks at the moment particularly podcasts at night a lot of people are discovering audio it's a really growing area because I suppose, you know, if you're working long hours during the day on the screen, sometimes reading, even in a book or whatever, it's, it's going to yeah. be a bit draining on the eyes. So yeah. audio has really um, opened things up for people in a different way. Um, but likewise, I have some beautiful gifted first editions that are on my shelves and I've got a whole library of books because mm -hmm. it's a lifetime spent of collecting them, mm -hmm. you know. 
And when James and I moved from house to house when we were younger, the biggest amount of things that we always had to carry were boxes of books. Books. <laughs> <laughs> and they come with us. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. I just, I just want to pick up what you mentioned about um, uh, audiobooks and 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 how even more so now when when life is lived ever more on screen. And and I wonder, does does the audiobook take us if we were lucky enough? if it takes us back to childhood when we were read to and how soothing it is to be read to. Yes, I think that's true. And you know, actually, um, my son even now, while I'm sitting chatting to you, Jackie, he popped his own little audio book on. He's a yeah. Harry Potter, of course. Of course. <laughs> <He> loves <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> um, while he's doing his marble runs and whatever else he's doing in his bedroom, you know, he just loves the soothing in the background. And I think you're right. I think it's... Um, it's sort of like a different kind of escape, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's thinking, um, it's that nostalgia. I think there's a nostalgia to it. Yes. And particularly um, in our household, actually, we use the old fashioned CDs because he quite likes to be able to go put them on on his little Robert CD player. And, and it's a sort of independence there for him. Yes. Um, yeah. But I know that people use Alexa, people are using all sorts of different uh, apps on their phone and everything, mm -hmm. you know, audible. However it happens, I think it's freed up a different world of um, companionship for people, mm -hmm. as well. you know, on long car journeys even. Um, as you say, at night time to listen to, um, you know, stories that are soothing for the soul that way. Um, yeah. and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend, you know, maybe like Stephen King just before bed. But <laughs> <laughs> or indeed some of mine. I don't know. Don't <laughs> so, I mean high force just before bed. No, no, no. <laughs> No. Uh, no. Anyway, anyway, to, to just lighten that dark moment that you nearly took us into, um, and, and this might seem a, a shallow question, so forgive me if it is, but in preparing for this evening, I, I, was, I was looking at, at your website, and, and am I correct in thinking that your book covers have changed a little bit? Well, we've got two versions. So um, I've got the book covers that are for the eBooks and the KDP print versions, which are still available. So anybody who is collecting those editions in paperback mm -hmm. will still be able to get them. So um, like, likewise, as I say, always about the reader. So mm -hmm. if you were collecting that set, they will always be available. And if you were to look for the eBook online, you would see the recognizable branding of, of what, I, what I always put out. Um, but for the fifth anniversary, this is the fifth year, as you said earlier, so I have brought out these fifth anniversary paperback editions. So uh, because it was for more of a bookstore market, we could have a bit more fun with, you know, the covers on those. And so um, I got in touch with a guy called Andrew Davidson, who's a fantastic artist. Mm. And he has done, um, you know, some really wonderful reworkings of um the places that we'd already found and used on our covers, but with more of a sort of artistic eye. So he did mm -hmm. them, they're like paintings wrapped around a book. Yes, so, yes. Yeah, he painted them in gouache. Um, and then we've obviously overlaid the text on top. So now it's a cover. And inside the books, we have um, a lovely map that he had drawn of the area as well. So, you know, people, as you say, the locations are so important. You can now, if you open the book uh, for these fifth anniversary editions, you can see a map of where each book is broadly set mm -hmm. um, and follow, you know, book by book. So that if you ever think, whereabouts is she talking about? If you're not from the region, yeah. just go to the front and, you know, you can see. Um, which actually kind of ties in with the plans to celebrate five years in the industry. Um, I, on my website, was going to bring out um, VCR Ryan Trails which now we've deferred, you know, given the current situation, but now we're going to defer it probably to next spring or whenever we are able and have some really big DCRI and weekends. So people can do walking trails, rediscover the landscape, mm -hmm. rediscover um, places to visit in the area uh, while doing these kind of literary trails. So um, we're going to have some big prizes at the end as well. So look out for that over the next few months, because I think hopefully by then we'll all be really ready to get back out there and enjoy um, the scenery. So mm. we're really working towards that and helping people rediscover. Mm. I love that combination of crime fiction and being out in, in those beautiful places um, 
and 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 it being an event as well that, that people can enjoy it's a fabulous thing to do um oh where to go i've got so many questions and it's really tricky but i think what we'll do is um because i want to come back of course to dci ryan and ds alex gregory but it, in what you've mentioned and, and talked before about getting books out to, to care homes at this time, this is this is not the first thing that you've ever thought of doing with regards to philanthropic works. Um, this is, you know, my experience with you is very much that, yes, I am an author, but I am engaged in other things. And, and so I wonder, could you tell us maybe some of the things that you are involved with and what they mean to you? Yeah, sure. Um... Well, I think that everyone in my family, you know, um, the way that I was brought up um, was always to share and to be mindful of everybody else in the world and in the community. And that's how we're bringing up Ethan as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel that in life, not just at the moment, but throughout my life, um, I might have worked hard, but I've also been fortunate. You know, mm -hmm. I've had opportunities. Um, you know, I was able to uh, to take advantage of those opportunities and, and work and, and help others. So, um, you know, in a world that is sometimes unequal, mm. I, I believe firmly in creating equality of opportunities. And so whether that be in the arts or whether that be in other areas, I'm ever more conscious now that I am a mum as well, um, of trying to just do my bit in the world around me to create a society that my son will be very happy being a part of you know in the future because it doesn't just happen you know you have to you have to help mm -hmm. help to build what you want to build um, and so that's kind of driven our decision making both as individuals and also um, as an author and also as a dark skies publishing now to get involved um, as much as possible with uh, philanthropy like you say so mm -hmm. in addition to uh, the Lindisfarne Prize. Um, we also run um, the Lindisfarne Reading Challenge, which was in its pilot year this year, so it will be rolled out as of next year. Um, mm -hmm. And that is basically a reading incentive program. It's designed to help the most disadvantaged schools. So um, if you look at, say, um, the Education Institute statistics, you'll see that there are geographic pockets around the country that suffer more than others. Mm -hmm. uh, in the disadvantage gap between children who at the same age um, are affected in different ways mm. both economically and on an education basis so we work together with um, Walker Riverside Academy which um, is in the east end of Newcastle for those who don't know um, and has about 1200 students um, and about 60 to 65 percent of those uh, would qualify for free school meals and also after that time there may be some who fall within the gap as well mm -hmm. so um, we uh, spoke to the school and we've developed a lovely relationship with them and they have some fantastic teachers by the way so dedicated the staff there um, as they are I'm sure around the country as well but um, in this situation we've been able to create um, a challenge where all the children have to do is they work together with their English teacher and they choose five books to read, increasing in, uh, you know, challenge as it goes on. Mm -hmm. And because we didn't want to overburden the staff, because we know they've got enough to do already, mm -hmm. we work together with Accelerated Reader Program. So some of these books may be ones that they planned to read as well as part of their Accelerated Reader Program. And using the statistics from there, it's enabled the teachers to kind of track their development to see whether having mm -hmm. them at the same time actually helps the children to progress um, or not, you know. Mm. So it's something that's that's helpful for all. But when the children complete their challenge, then they get to choose um, a prize from a list. So mm. that can include, um, you know, sports vouchers. Because what we found was we didn't want to create any stigma whatsoever. So if a child was in need of, say, trainers or football boots or something like this, um, and had hoped for them but maybe couldn't quite have them, mm. um, it's a way that they themselves can feel that they've earned. Um, the best to be able to then go and spend it on some boots if they want. Yeah. We have um, a range of different ones. So um, all the children who compete get a book voucher as well. So books are still key. Uh, but in addition, they can choose a prize from the list um, and put it towards whatever they might fancy, you know. Um, yeah. 
children, you know, I think always kind of respond to feeling that actually they really put the work in and then they've got something that they really fancy at the end of it, you know. And in a situation where frivolities um, might not be possible for all yeah. yeah. We felt that that might be quite meaningful for them. And it's, it's had a really positive uptake from the children and our discussions with the school are that it's, um, it's really encouraged them to not only read during class reading time, but to actually bring the books home, you know, and start reading on their own time, which mm. is something that they were really keen to see progress and happen. So that's had a really fantastic impact. And obviously with the present situation, it's um, added a slight layer of complexity for mm. all of the education system, but we're continuing the challenge. So the children can read at home and they have access to uh, a database of free books as well, but a lot of the children took books out of the school library as well um, to take home. So they can still work towards that. And we can just provide them with the e vouchers as well. So we find ways and means so that yeah. the child feels um, that they haven't had a chance. You know? So this is something that uh, all being well, we hope to roll out to more schools as we mm -hmm. learn the best way to manage it. Um, but as of next year, hopefully the world will be back to uh, something approximating normality mm -hmm. rather than later, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, and as soon as we are able to do that, we will uh, open it up to, to more children as well. That's wonderful. Louise, I, I, you know, I, I'm ever in awe of your energy and vision, um, you know, for, for all that you get involved in. Um, and, and uh, you know, coming back to when we began this conversation and you spoke about, you know, just having a go, you know, try something, have that, you know, and, and that, yeah, as I say, I, I very much respect and admire all that you do. I'm conscious of time, but, I, but would you allow us, could we, could we go back to your protagonists? Yeah. Would that be all right? Um, oh, I, you know, 15, 15 books on, I think, with, with right, am I right, 15 books on? Yes, yeah, 16 is coming out on the 10th of May. Oh, now, ho hold on to 16, because I'm, I'm, I know we're not allowed spoilers, but I do want a little bit of insight if we're allowed. <laughs> so, so, so let's say, okay, so 16 books with Ryan. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, that's quite a relationship. I'm, I'm thinking if it were a book a year, 16 years with someone, it's quite, you know. How do you feel about him now, mm -hmm. as opposed to when you set off with him? Um, I think... Uh... I think what's really nice is you can kind of see um, the healing because the whole, the, the premise of him going to Holy Island was um, to heal. You know, he'd been hurt, but not in a, in a sort of, I mean, it was, it was sad what happened to him. I won't say spoilers, but it wasn't one of those things that should um, be extraordinary, really. It was something that a lot of people could experience and that's grief you know grief is something that at one stage or another we all experience and one of the things that i drew upon there is that we had lost a loved one um not so long before that and i think that those emotions it's very much a human emotion that at some point or another unfortunately we will all feel um and so that's something that i wanted to bring through and it's tracking i suppose if you really talk about it through his character I was uh, tracking in a cathartic way my own mm. process uh, through that. Um, but, you know, as I said earlier, you, you put little pieces of yourself into everything. Um, and I suppose that's why the character of Phillips is based heavily on my grandfather, because he is the one who passed away. Mm. And I recall all of his little phrases. Every time I write dialogue with him, it's like being reconnected. Mm, and, beautiful. Yeah. And, then as they walk through as a partnership in this fictional world it's for a person who is not religious as myself it's a way of of having him still be there you know mm. but in a nice positive way and so ryan is probably slightly more more like me although obviously you know not very mm. much so, but in this particular scenario and then if he ever needs guidance then you've got sort of phillips there to sort of step in and I suppose we all the idea was to create characters where we've all felt at times um at a loss for the direction to take and you know I've always said with Ryan I wanted him to be aspirational I wanted him to be somebody 
that um, could have been male or female, by the way. You know, it's for me, because I'm a female writer, I found it easier to dissociate. And so I made mm -hmm. him male. Yeah. Uh, but as with many of my characters, you know, really, you could flip them the other way around. And so the gender thing is sort of incidental, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but with Ryan, I wanted it to be the case that throughout the story, there's a, a sense that he will always act in a way that is um, in keeping with his moral yardstick. And I know that through my life, I've tried my best at all times to act in that way. But there are always times where you look back and think, oh, I wish I'd said that, or I wish I'd done that, or why didn't I do that sooner? And it's nice to be able to write a character who is decisive and confident and mm. um, acts always um, in accordance with his conscience and not uh, and is never swayed by the outside world, you know. And so that is aspirational, I think. So mm. that's so lovely. And that has remained a constant throughout the series with him, and that hasn't changed. But I think his... Uh, emotional state has deepened as a character because he's grown in emotional confidence through his relationship with Anna, his mm. friendships have grown, um, he's had more experiences that shape and mold him but he's come out so he's a constant phoenix rising you know um, but it's very much a peak and trough situation. Uh, the rising isn't always from the very depths uh, mm. you know, in every book because I mean that would just be exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> But beautiful. I, I, I love the notion of him, that, that emotional deepening uh, as well. Um, and, I, and I wondered, you know, and you said about the, the notion of a character with a moral compass that is decisive. And I, and I do think, you know, in, in these times where we get to hear, sadly, time and time again of maybe our heroes, public figures, people like that, whose moral compass maybe does get a little... Yes. you know goes askew a bit or, or we feel let down and I think to have a literary character that we can hold on to this is you know well, that's it and it's actually a pleasure to write him you know um and I, I've had a lot of readers get in touch saying I can't wait to read the shrine because you know at the moment as you say there's such uncertainty there's a feeling of disconnect at times and um feeling very isolated not just physically but from the rest of our communities and society and so Having someone like that who can bring a sort of strength, um, I think, is a, is a joy to write. It definitely, you know, mm. I think for myself, it's very fun to write, and I, I'm glad that people seem to enjoy um, the reading experience. And you know, it gives them uh, an uplift. Mm -hmm. And and speaking of which, you know, yeah. because I know there will be thousands of people out there waiting for for number sixteen. Can, can you either tell us the title? Can you give us a little insight? Can you tell us where he might be going? Because of course that's probably in the title. Anything you can say without giving too much away. Yeah, so the shrine is based in Durham and it's named after Cuthbert's Shrine, which uh, for those who haven't visited the cathedral, it's beautiful Gothic structure, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it's perched on this little craggy, beautiful sort of um, setting. Um, uh, the summit above the river weir as it runs through Durham and um, the story um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of how can I say this without spoilers <laughs> basically, <laughs> <I'm> like, mm. <laughs> uh, basically um, you've got Ryan is based in Northumbria CID but something happens that will take him to Durham so he has to step in temporarily to go back to a place where he once lived with Anna who is still um, a, uh, a lecturer at uh, the fictional version of Durham University. Mm -hmm. So she's in the history faculty. And there is an incident in Durham, which is serious, and it takes him over there. Um, several people are put in peril that are important <laughs> to him. Mm -hmm. and so it, it really brings home everything that is most important in his life. Um, and it also is a case of um, uncovering in this book, uh, shall I say, something that is a deeper threat. So by the end of the story, people may come to the end of the book and think, well, that's the resolution. But I am weaving in a secondary storyline that will follow through into the book after and needs longer to develop. <laughs> um, because we have somebody uh, who has been operating for quite some time uh, in a very insidious way 
in the area and this is something that um, just by chance uncovers uh, a portion of what he's been doing. So Ryan begins to get a feel for this through this story um, and it will be a battle. So that's the way, best way to describe it. It's not so much this is, this is maybe the battle in this book, but then it's just the beginning of a new kind of war. Mm. So it's very exciting. I like writing a good baddie. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so um, I know because of the state of things at the minute, it's a bit tricky. But, but do you do you have a, a date when that will be available? Yes. Yeah, so um, we had to delay it by two weeks, unfortunately, because as you say, all of our editors and proofreaders, everyone's been affected. So it's now the tenth of May, which is not too far away. Um, and then uh, at the end of May, the thirty-first, we'll have Bedlam, which is the third Gregory book coming out. So you get mm. two books in May. Uh, coming out. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, we can't not mention DS Alex Gregory because that would be very rude not to allow some space there. Um, to set off on a journey like that, were you worried that after the success of DCI Ryan that this might not hit the mark? Um, not really. I think uh... I think it depends on the reason why you write. Um, I've, I've always, whenever I approach a new book, um, I see it as something completely fresh, even if it's part of a series, even if it's part of the DCI Ryan series. And I think that as a writer, that keeps you quite humble because I never ever take anything for granted. You know, I think this is an entirely new project, even if it forms part of a series and it must be taken on its own merits. So that's mm -hmm. the way that I always approach it. Um, Dr. Gregory is um, a completely different beast. And I think for um, many readers, they instantly seem to click with that because he is so different to Ryan. And, and that's the joy of writing him because it keeps things very, very fresh for me in a creative sense. Because I'm, when I'm writing a Gregory book, there is no fear of me ever slipping into Ryan. You know, I think it, it just, uh, Gregory is much more of a, a misanthropic character. He's not where Ryan is yet. He has a much longer journey to go. So mm -hmm. although his job as a psychologist and uh, is to help people, he's still learning to like people. So, mm -hmm. so that's his journey and there are very good reasons for that. Um, and you know, it's fantastic that actually the first, I mean, I, again, I had no preconceptions and I didn't like to assume anything because I think that that takes the challenge out of it as well. I think that as a writer, you have to stay challenged and to mm -hmm. challenge yourself and to try to get better all the time. And Imposter was the first book in the Gregory series and really delighted that it was actually shortlisted for the British Book Awards, which was a, a completely unexpected thing. I never would have imagined that that would mm -hmm. have happened. But it's, it's wonderful that, um, you know, people have seen something in that that... Mm -hmm. uh, um, that resonated and it was again really human issues so um, you know you're talking about deep sort of psychological issues with mm. social ones as well but uh, again with settings because I can't resist it you know imposter was that <laughs> island um, I can't <laughs> I love a good mountain <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah, mm -hmm. in Ireland and then hysteria was in Paris because you know I love Paris mm. and, and the third one, Bedlam, will be set in North America. So, wow, yeah, wow, oh, lovely, home and away. You, yes. you know, you, you, you allow us to. And, and I'm thinking, if there's anybody who is watching um, this evening's session, uh, and anybody who watches it subsequently, because that you know, the, these will be upon, you know, there for, for viewing in perpetuity. I hope um, the thought that there are people there who may not as yet have got to your books. And what an amazing journey there is for people because there's, you know, there's so much there of, of you know, know the region and, and now with Alex Gregory and be taken elsewhere as well. I think that's wonderful. I have one more question and the question isn't mine, I must oh, say. Yes. Um, I, I know that you are familiar with Susan Heads from the book Trail. Yes. And I just want to say uh, as well, um, because in, in preparing to speak with you I, I actually went on Susan's book trails and you know to familiarize myself with all those different areas so thank you Susan uh, for the work that you've done with that but she um she's been my go-to person for 
lockdown questions. It's been very good. And she asked, how do you feel Ryan would cope were he in lockdown? And the subsequent part was, who do you think would cope better, Ryan or Anna? Ooh, that is interesting. Um, I think that, uh, I think he would actually probably stalk around the house for the first few weeks. He would mm -hmm. be like a prowling tiger because he's not used to being inactive. Um, he's used to going and fixing things and being helpful and productive in the community. Um, and he, although he has a small circle of friends, I, I don't think uh, he realizes how much he relies on that human mm -hmm. interaction with the job that he does. So I think that he would be surprised to find that he misses that level of interaction with people. Um, I think he probably likes bacon stotties more than he admits. So <laughs> the fact that currently things are closed, that would be fairly devastating. Um, I think that if he wasn't self-isolating with Phillips McKenzie and, and Samantha, he might be quite sad about that as well. Um, I think Anna was resigned as a person to being um, quite solitary and quite introverted long before she met Ryan. She didn't expect, expect to meet anyone and share a life because mm -hmm. she was very nihilistic in that sense. So I think that she will actually take to quiet self-isolation quite well. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, it'll mostly be that she'll be telling Ryan off for prowling around her house and maybe stop reorganizing my cupboards and things like that. <laughs> yeah, just give me some space alone. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. They'll have a lot of laughs, I think. As, as well, yeah, yeah. LJ Ross, Louise, it has been absolutely wonderful to spend this time together. Um, I'm sorry that we have to cut you because, again, there are things I, I hope you'll allow me to quiz you again at some point for all that I still have written here that I haven't asked. Wish you all the very best um, with The Shrine and Bedlam coming out um, later later this month, which is, which is wonderful. We don't have long to wait for some fabulous tales. And with the other ventures that you're involved in as well, you know, all the very best with that. And I look forward, you, you will come back next year will you not and, and reprise this in a way my questions will be varied i have others i've not asked but you will come back won't you thank you very much for having me jackie a pleasure thank you